Hi, everybody. My name is Charity Counts, and I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Midwest Museums. AMM is located in Indianapolis, Indiana, the ancestral homelands of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, Shawnee, We, and Kickapoo communities. I am joining you from my home office today, which has blue walls and white doors. Behind me is a painting of a woman holding her head in her hand. I'm a fair-skinned white woman with a dark with dark brown shoulder length hair and dark eyes. And I'm wearing my Proud Museum person t-shirt, of course, <laughs> my uniform for these events. Uh, thank you for joining us for the final lunchtime leadership chat today in the Mutual of America Museum Leadership Series. I have thoroughly enjoyed and learned from all the conversations we've hosted in this, ser this series. And I'm grateful to Mutual of America for bringing us together and for offering their support and thought leadership for this these important and timely topics. Please join me uh, in thanking Mutual of America's team for making the series possible by a round of applause or clicking your reaction buttons or offering comments in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourselves for this. Thanks, thank you to everybody. Thanks, Adam and Doug. Okay, before we start today's session, I want to run through a couple housekeeping items. Uh, this session is hosted in Zoom meeting. Um, this is so that you can join the conversation by video, audio, or in the chat. If you wish to join by audio or video, I ask that you raise your hand using the reaction tool at the bottom of your screen. I'll then unmute you or request that you unmute yourself and invite you to into the conversation as soon as I can. We have enabled Zoom's live transcription feature. Um, in order to turn this on or off, you can click the CC button in the menu at the bottom of your screen. We also have an ASL interpreter with us today. I have them spotlighted today on, their, on our screens, so they should stay on your screen at all times. But if you wish to move them, I think you can click and drag them across your screen to a different place or pin them yourself uh, in a preferred location. And finally, we are recording today's chat to share with participants who cannot join us live. And of course, an opportunity for you to watch it again later or share it with team members at your museums. The focus of today's chat is post-pandemic fundraising strategies. And joining me are five panelists, three team members from the Walker Arts Center, uh, and two representatives from Mutual of America. We'll start with our friends from Mutual of America and have them introduce themselves. And then we will have staff from the Walker Arts Center introduce themselves too. So Adam, I'll have you go first and then Doug. Perfect, thanks Charity. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for the last of the uh, luncheon series. I'm Adam Johnson. I head up the operations in our new Kansas City office. Doug. Thanks Adam and thank you everyone for joining. My name is uh, Doug Pasick. I'm with Mutual America. I'm the Vice President of Financial Consulting. Um, yeah, I'll, and I'll wait for my other stuff when I talk. Thank you. Um, Aaron, Megan, and Sean. Hi, Charity. Uh, thanks for uh, having us join you today. And thanks to our friends at Mutual of America for organizing this. Uh, my name is Aaron Mack. I'm at the Walker Art Center. I'm a development associate in corporate relations. Sean. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Sean O'Donnell. I uh, am the development associate institutional giving uh, at the walker, and we can get into that, what that means a little later. Megan? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Megan Dunn, and I'm on our special projects team, and uh, that means I deal with restricted gifts, um, both individuals and foundations, um, and yeah, I'll be talking more about that later, so thanks. Great. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, so just for everyone's reference, these chats have been pretty conversational. Um, we've got you know, a series of questions that we're gonna run through, but we welcome you to ask questions yourselves, you know, post them in the chat. And like I said, raise your hand using your reaction tool if you wanna ask a question live. Uh, we'll work, we'll fold those questions into our conversation as we go. Um, and before we dive into questions specifically, Sean, um, let's have you share an overview of the Walker Arts Center uh, for those of us who may not be as familiar. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, and if anyone has been to the Walk Art Center and has some amazing memories, throw it into chat. I would love to feel the love there. Um, but so the Walker, if you are not familiar, is outside of downtown Minneapolis in Minnesota. Uh, the institution is situated on a 19 acre site, which is home to both uh, the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. And if you've ever looked up a, a photo of uh, Minnesota or visited Minnesota, you've probably seen a big spoon with a cherry on it. Uh, that's a really famous landmark, and that's located in our sculpture garden. Uh, and then also on that 19 acre site, we have our galleries, cinemas, and theater. Um, the Walker Art Center, and you'll probably hear it throughout the way we describe it, is a multidisciplinary art center, um, and that serves as a catalyst for the creative expression of artists and the active engagement of audiences. And then we focus on the visual, performing, and media arts of our time. And we take a global, multidisciplinary, and diverse approach to uh, kind of the collection, preservation, and presentation of art. Um, and so when we talk about multidisciplinary program, we kind of have six departments along with our permanent collection that we use uh, to engage audiences with. Um, our collection is around upwards of 15,000 works by 2,000 plus artists. Um, encompasses the whole of the 20th and 21st century, but we have a particular focus of the 1960s to now. Uh, we have our visual arts department, which um, focuses on um, presenting a mix of uh, emerging and established artists across a broad spectrum of media. Uh, we have our performing arts department, uh, and it's one of the largest museum-based contemporary programs in the U.S. Uh, Pre-pandemic times, we did about 50 to 70 performances in our uh, in-house theater, and then we also partner with a number of organizations across uh, the Twin Cities to present work. Uh, we also have our moving image department, uh, which shows classic films, retrospectives, conversations with directors, um, and that again is on a Insight Cinema. And we also have a large collection of uh, artist films um, and our movie image collection, which we have kind of a smaller venue on site that we kind of curate uh, a viewing of those. Uh, we have an in-house design team, which uh, kind of produces and handles our institutional graphic identity and publications that we do in-house. And then kind of the heart of our commitment to engage diverse audiences, uh, interpretation initiatives is our education and public programs, uh, which we, last year I was just thinking about it. Uh, we just rebranded as public engagement learning and impact, which is really kind of our effort to focus and center audiences. Uh, just to give you a quick rundown of numbers for size, on the average year, uh, we have around 700 to 800,000 visitors each year, uh, and you know, roughly around 2 million plus uh, interactions online. And you know, this last year with virtual programming, we served around 32,000 people through uh, like Zoom webinars, workshops, and everything we did online. Our current budget in our current fiscal year right now is 22 million. Uh, you know, we kind of had jumped up from you know a drop. We dropped down to 17 million last fiscal year. You know, I, I think everyone's probably experiencing expenses are coming back a little quicker than revenue. Um, so that's kind of right. Roughly, we have around 120 full time. Uh, staff and then our development team which Aaron Megan and I are part of is 11 people and it's split between uh, annual fund and special projects which is kind of a mix between restricted and unrestricted giving um, that we deal with so that's a quick overview great thanks John um, so you know just building on that a little bit um, what's changed about your strategies for membership and general giving? at the Walker in the past year? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's important to recognize, you know, in March 14th, the Walker shut its doors due to COVID restrictions and, um, you know, government mandates. And then on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered. So we were in the Twin Cities, um, you know, we were kind of faced with, you know, the way we've kind of been describing it as a dual pandemic. Um, and so, our fiscal year goes from uh, July 1 to June 30th. And so this all this happened kind of in our last uh, quarter of our fiscal year. And, you know, so as we're creating uh, solicitations, generating ask, kind of doing our follow-up on proposals to close out that year, and also, you know, always looking ahead, 
uh, it felt really inappropriate and wrong um, uh, at certain times to go ahead and make those asks when we normally would, just given everything that was going on. So we spent a lot of time adjusting the timing of when we made asks. And we also, you know, a shift, the big shift that we made is really being upfront and addressing the realities of how we are being impacted. I know I've talked to a number of our other uh, partners, you know, and not everyone was as upfront. We were, we were pretty upfront, like this is how we're being directly impacted, not just from the pandemic, but also this reality that we're all living in, you know, and everything that was going on in our city. Um, and, in, and we also kind of shifted our language to, you know, this was an opportunity where everyone was being impacted. It wasn't just us as the walker saying like, hey, look at us, look at us, give us money. We were all impacted in some way or other, and it was really leading with that and addressing that, and you know, and really trying to for, uh, forefront that. And you know, a lot of that in the change in language was leading with empathy. I would say it was kind of our big shift. And then the other shift, um, it kind of presented this opportunity for us to center impact in our narrative in a way that we don't always do. Um, it's something that we have been talking a lot about, you know, kind of how do we incorporate storytelling a little more? Um, and so we've always are collecting this information. We have a lot of data on it. We just don't always put it in the work. And when we weren't able to have programming because of everything being shut down, it kind of became this opportunity for us to be able to, um, put forward those, um, impact statements, you know, from our work, you know, of breaking down barriers for access to the museum, for working with uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Um, and then, you know, because we have been doing that work for a while, we were able to say, hey, here's the immediate work that we are doing, and here's the work that we have been doing leading up to these moments. Um, you know, so an example is um, an immediate response that we had is we diverted $120,000 from our acquisitions fund and we spread that across 10 of our partner organizations in the community. And we said, hey, um, you know, you guys work with artists. Can you select some artists and we'll give them $5,000, no strings attached. And we'll also give you as an organization $2,000. So that was an immediate shift that we had that we could highlight and talk about in our um, fundraising language. But then it was also, you know, oh, there's all these other things. So it wasn't just a, hey, we all of a sudden are realizing uh, you know, there's a lot of issues in our community. It was, hey, we've been doing this for a while, and here's how we're immediately addressing it, and here's the work we've been doing leading up to it. That's really interesting. You know, I, I had written down empathy and circled it before you said <laughs> uh, but I love to hear that you started to think about, you know, how do you shift your messaging and, and um, acknowledge what everybody was going through. You know, this is a time that's challenging for everyone. So I a question. Charity, can, yeah. I, can I just yeah. jump into, you know, if yeah. we're gonna yeah. go with the conversational things and just add to, you know, what Sean said. One of the things we realized early on, <clears throat> you know, when we kind of closed our doors, you know, oftentimes much of our um, bandwidth is taken up messaging programming that's that's rolling out you know, inviting uh, our corporate partners to attend things. And, you know, as Sean pointed out, that wasn't really going on, but we realized that it was an important opportunity to, you know, continue to connect with our corporate partners. And so, you know, all three of us, Sean, Megan, and I were, were kind of just on the phones, just checking in, um, you know, not asking for anything and saying, how are you guys, you know, here's what's going on at the Walker. How are you guys doing it? What's going on at your companies? How are you navigating the, the pandemic? And, and just sort of connecting on that more basic human level, um, not as, you know, fundraiser or, or whatever, but more as partner. Um, and it really, I think it's, it's, it's paid dividends. And it's something that we'll probably fold, try to fold into ongoing practice um, to be able, you know, it's it's always a, a challenge as far as bandwidth goes, but um, I think that everybody on the team here would agree that it was, um, you know, time well spent uh, during the early part of the pandemic. Yeah. Well, I, I want to kind of go back to something you said, Sean, too, related to the shift in messaging. You talked a little bit about emphasizing impact. 
in your message? And was that data you already had around that you could pull from? So then what resonated the most? Like, what are you collecting and what, what were you sharing specifically that you felt really drove home the point, you know? Yeah, so, you know, all of it kind of depends on who the audience is always, you know, so we always have, you know, if we're talking to uh, our general members on our annual fund team, um, you know, they have a slightly different, you know, they have around six, 7,000 members, 8,000, you know, it fluctuates a little, you know, they might have a different message than, you know, what Aaron would have when he, you know, has been working with a company for 10 years, you know, so there's always a slightly different message that gets in that. But what we were able to do then is instead of just saying, as an example, like maybe we have like a template language where we're like, you know, you're giving that we would maybe do every year. It's like, you're giving, you know, supports the arts and the, um, you know, access for students and, uh, you know, help balance our budget. Let's just say that was the example that we would normally do. This time we were able to kind of incorporate stories that we had collected from, let's say, a program that we got uh, feedback from that we partnered with in the PD. So kind of taking these concrete examples to bolster uh, some of our messaging that we normally don't highlight outside of our, like our annual report. So kind of bringing in these specific um, narratives, but also kind of thinking about thinking about the moment we're in and picking data that supports kind of what we're talking about. So yes, yeah, so this is, uh, and I'll get into it later. Like we do a lot of work in collecting data, um, both just as, as general, as much as we can about our audience, but just internally how we operate. Um, and so we're, so we have a plethora of data and then, so it was just kind of pumping that in, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, so we could easily say, this is how we were immediately impacted with our doors being closed without having, um, earned revenue, uh, coming in. And this is, uh, but this is how the shifts we've made and these are the partnerships that we are, uh, emphasizing or artists that we are working with in the community in this moment. And here's how it's affecting the communities that they are situated in. Okay. All right. Let's, thanks. I was just curious about that. Um, Megan, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, the world you are in <laughs> at, at the Walker and I know you have a focus on performing arts programs. Yeah. So what happened for you this past year? What did you encounter? What, how did you shift gears? Yeah, so part of my work, um, a big part of my work is um, working with our producers council, uh, which is a group of donors that provide direct support to our performing arts program. Um, and those gifts range from $2,500 up to 60000 and beyond. Um, and it, I mean, it's not a huge group of people, but um, it's, a, you know, a substantial amount of support. Um, and as Sean mentioned, you know, there typically in a typical year there would be about fifty um, or more performing arts events, you know, curated performing arts events um, happening in our theater or other spaces. Um, and then in addition to that, I I was also doing other events. I mean, what you know, a lot of the performing arts centric donors are they really look to connect to both our curator and also the artists. So I was, you know, I was doing. Um, you know, we had a, a dinner every year connected to a program. I mean, I like, it's odd to think about now, but uh, in like two years ago, right now in August of 2019, I took a group of donors to Edinburgh to go to the theater festivals. I mean, <laughs> which I'm glad, I'm glad I got that done <laughs> before all this happened. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it was a lot, it was a little more flashy, you know, we were, I, I was doing more cultivation events. Um, in addition to the curated events um, that the, the program was doing. And, and so obviously all that, you know, went away. Um, and, and I just, I, I mean, immediately just kind of shifted to like, well, we have to keep, we have to keep these people who are so invested in this program, we have to keep them informed uh, you know, we can't just go radio silent just because there's no events happening. So I just kind of took to sending out a lot of personal emails. Um, and I would say probably about once a month, I would, I would, you know, get in touch with people or write something for our curator to send out just personally. That's the other thing that I think 
we have noticed in hindsight is that um, a lot of our communications in development um, looked very similar, like the email, like just the format of the email, like look similar to everything else that donors were getting from the Walker, which is fine. You know, the Walker has a brand and like, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that especially for higher level donors, they're getting a lot of those emails every week from the Walker. Um, and who, I don't know if they open them. Right. So, um, or, I mean, if they, I can tell if they open them maybe, but I don't necessarily know if they're reading and absorbing. So having a personal email and getting responses to those, I think was, I mean, I think it was, I, I think that they all appreciated it, but I think also it was gratifying to me um, as a fundraiser to have like more of an exchange. So um, that was, that was a focus. And then once we started, you know, doing virtual programming, I would say that the programming was dark for um, probably about nine months. And then we started doing some virtual programs and I made it a point to um, make sure they each got a personal invitation to each of those events. And I was sending out links, making sure they didn't have to go through the paywall um, and just making it really easy for them to engage with our programming instead of, you know, like doing, doing what they're doing every night, watching Netflix or whatever else, you know, it's so much, it's so, so easy to do something that you don't have to like do the paywall thing for. Um, and I just, for this group of people, I just really wanted them to stay engaged with what we're doing. So, I mean, I think, I, you know, we haven't seen anybody like drop off really from that group, which is great um, in such an odd year. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that is why and that, that all that effort paid off. And I think it is something that um, moving forward, I'm gonna be just, you know, doing a lot more of, so. Yeah, that's great. Well, I know, um, Aaron, you mentioned already that, you know, you kind of shifted a bit of your approach and messaging working with corporate uh, partners, but do you want to expand on that a little bit? You know, what, what changed uh, in your approach and, and uh, about the interests of corporations and corporate foundations that you work with and, you know, how did you stay in touch and coordinate? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Charity. So just, just to, you know, reiterate, maybe clarify. So my role at the Walker, I really do focus on corporate sponsorships. Um, so, and those are, you know, different from our corporate membership program that Sean oversees. Um, you know, corporate sponsorships are, you know, it's really directed funding. It's, you know, falls under that special projects umbrella. Uh, so, companies that are interested in underwriting, you know, an exhibition presentation, a, a film presentation, uh, you, you performing arts, so specific, specifically directed, they, they in the, you know, usually have some goals. It's always nice when they can articulate those goals. One of my challenges is that a lot of times corporate sponsors aren't so good, you know, they have some general sense of what they want to get out of it, but you know, one of my jobs is to kind of work with them and try to understand, are they looking to, you know, build brand? Are they, are they looking to just affiliate with the Walker? Are they looking to build a hospitality platform uh, in which to engage clients and prospects? Are they looking to connect with the Walker's particular donor base? Um, because depending on what those objectives are, that helps me tailor a benefits package that, you know, I can build. We have a variety of things that we can bring. We try not to do cookie cutter um, when we, we do our, uh, put our sponsorships together. Um, you know, and then of course, we also have to be sensitive to programming content and, and what that is. Um, but to sort of illustrate a little bit about how companies' interests evolved, responded to the dual crises that were going on here in the Twin Cities, as Sean talked about, both the, the social unrest and the pandemic, the, the physical pandemic. Um, I, you know, there's two, two illustrations and, and I'm gonna use Mutual America as one of them um, because Mutual America has been a long time uh, partner of the Walker. I mean, not only do we enjoy their, the guidance of their professionals they manage the Walker's uh, employee 403B program. And so are on campus regularly uh, talking to employees, uh, giving advice regarding financial planning and things like that, which is fantastic. But in addition to that, they have been a consistent um, sponsor of the Walker's annual benefit event. Um, 
And uh, in the past, we've called that event Avant Garden. Um, it uh, typically takes place in September. Um, we had to uh, cancel, uh, obviously, the 2020 uh, event. And, um, you know, Mute, when Mutual America heard about that, they immediately said, well, what can we do? How can we help? And some other way. And we, you know, asked if they would pivot and, um, you know, make a directed contribution to become a corporate member and just support our operations at that point, which was where, you know, I'm sure many of you experienced this funding was, you know, really needed because it is those unrestricted dollars that are the most valuable. Um, and, and they, you know, immediately, you know, they were, were gr grateful for their flexibility. Um, they saw, you know, that we were having trouble and they, they wanted to step up to the plate. I mean, our, our benefit event usually raises a million dollars for the institution and we welcome 1500 people. Um, so when that kind of went away, you know, Sean talked a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on our budget um, at the end of, I guess, what would have been our fiscal 19, because um, we basically didn't have a fourth quarter. Um, and I wanna say that, you know, we were directly impacted to the tune of about $3 million um just in lost revenue just by not being able to do performances and other major programs um so mutual america really stepped up and we were incredibly grateful not only for them organizing this little session um i mean i was thrilled when they reached out and asked us to participate because again you know when we can connect more deeply with our corporate partners by doing things like this um, it's great for, for us and it's great for them. It's just kind of a win-win. Um, but sort of more specifically, when you talk about sort of changing interests, we, um, right before the pandemic, we embarked on a, a very large sponsorship with another financial services company. Um, and they were sponsoring our performing arts season. Well, as Megan just mentioned that, kind of, you know, when the pandemic hit, performing arts just shut down. Um, the original motivation uh, behind the sponsorship were, was twofold. It was kind of getting the brand um, out into the market. This was a company that was kind of new to the Twin Cities. And so they wanted to, um, you know, make it known that they were here. They were, you know, becoming a community partner and getting involved. But they were very, very much looking at the hospitality platform um, that, that could be built around these programs. And of course, that when that went away, you know, they started to rethink, you know, well, what are we going to do here? Um, and so we started talking to them um, about having more of an institutional alignment. Um, you know, they came to us and they said, you know, we really, we want, like Mutual America did, we want to help the institution in general as best we can, but we're also really looking to highlight the support that we're giving to the community in general. Um, so we, you know, did some internal brainstorming and in fact tapped into our public engagement learning and impact team and said, you know, what kind of needs are you seeing out in the community? And um, our Pelly team works with both the Minneapolis and St. Paul public school systems. And, you know, they were hearing from their contacts that they are, you know, they've got all these kids at home doing distance learning or, you know, underfoot and, you know, parents are juggling 18 things. And we came up with this idea to create um, art activities you know, put together art kits, basically. So art supplies, along with, you know, kind of easy to do at home activities and make them available to, um, you know, Minneapolis St. Paul public school students. We focused on Title I school. So where I think it's something like 40% of the students are eligible for that kind of assistance. And, um, with the help from this financial services company, uh, they provided the underwriting for the art materials and we put together like a co-branded tote bag um, and we put the materials in there and we you know, 
we, our Pelly team kind of came up with three or four different art activities. And um, we ended up, we, we gave them out like during the summer, St. Paul public schools um, give out meals to, um, you know, eligible families. And so we just set ourselves up at these meal sites. Um, there were representatives from our corporate partner who were there and they helped us give out these kits. Um, and then as we rolled into the beginning of the school year in 2020, um, you know, we just, and there were some classes were coming back, but we used the schools as distribution points and we were able to supply the art kits and work with the art teachers at those schools to supply these materials. Um, and over the course of the year gave out 8,000 kits. And so it, it not only, so it was providing direct support to the community in a need, it gave our partner a wonderful story to tell. They um, uh, arranged for an interview to be written up um, with, uh, with the woman in our uh, public education learning and impact group who kind of coordinated all of this. Um, and she talked about how it had come together and how they had come in and support the, supported the efforts. And then they um, had that written up and it was on one of their internal websites. So they got to tell that story. Um, you know, so, I mean, it, it sort of falls into that cause related marketing um, arena, but I mean, it, it was for real. I mean, it actually, you know, allowed us to, you know, support our community partners in the Minneapolis St. Paul public school systems. Um, and then in tandem with that, they shifted away from their performing arts sponsorship and became what we call a premier partner at the Walker, which is kind of our highest level of um, corporate membership um, where they get brand recognition and, um, you know, again, could sort of highlight, hey, we're, we're here, we're not going anyplace, <clears throat> we're supporting the Walker, you know, as one of the important cultural institutions of the Twin Cities. Um, you know, we were very fortunate that they were able to articulate kind of how they wanted to pivot. And of course, they've, you know, moved completely away from hospitality to just being more focused, focused on, hey, we want to be a good community partner. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about, you know, what I, and I'm, again, I saw it with Mutual America. I've seen it with these guys. We've seen it with others who, you know, designed and Sean, you know, got exposure to this where we had companies, you know, creating COVID relief related giving programs, whether those were funded by the corporate foundation um, or done through a sponsorship, um, you know, the result was the same. There, there was definitely a response from the corporate community to these crises where they kind of shifted away from hospitality and, and, and sort of the more maybe traditional things that you would see around sponsorship to these more kind of community focused initiatives. Um, Aaron, I feel like, well, first of all, I, I love that philosophy to, or the approach to asking, you know, what are the goals and thinking of it as a partnership, a, a collaborative effort. And that, that the examples you shared didn't just benefit the museum, they benefited the community that you serve. Um, but does it feel like it became its own sort of special project? <laughs> I mean, do you, do you feel like sometimes collaborations like that can, are they adding work to people's plates, I guess? Or is it something that, you know, everybody felt like internally and externally, it, was, it just fit right into the program and, and it was worth it because it means this relationship has grown? Well, in the, in the case of this premier partner, it definitely added work. I mean, creating these, these art kits, you know, but it's, it was completely in line with the mission of our public you know, engagement, learning and impact group, um, you know, so again, having us out in the community and, and allowing us to do this for our community partners, you know, isn't, was completely in line with our mission. Um, would we have done it had we not had that support? And, and let me just say, you know, they, they paid for all the materials and then there was a nice little fee on top of it, you know, that went to support the, you know, the, the sponsorship fee that's just, you know, for our, that went to support general operations of our, our Pelly team. Um, but this, we're, we're right in starting the process of renewing our 
partnership with this company. And they've made it very clear that they actually want to see a community uh, engagement component as part of a renewal. And they said, you know, it makes it a lot easier for us to sell the sponsorship piece internally if we also have you guys helping us connect with the community in this way. So I guess we kind of look at it as the, the you know, yes, it, it may take a little bit of extra work, but if it ends up getting us a six figure partnership, well, then it's probably worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Adam and Doug, I am interested in hearing your perspectives as the folks on the sort of other side of this conversation, you know, as sponsors or grantors. Um, how did Mutual of America stay in touch with existing clients or reach new ones in the past year? And what opportunities did you seek to present or that were presented to you that appealed to you? It sounds like the partnership with the Walker is a great example, but. Absolutely. Thanks, Charity. And I'll, I'll answer some of that. Thanks, Aaron, for, for sharing that information. And, and certainly, you know, there's kind of two sides of it as far as how the pandemic affected sort of our day-to-day, -day, you know, activities as far as communicating with our clients. Um, it, as Aaron mentioned as well, too, one of the things we pride ourselves in is being there to really handhold both our organizations and the employees of, the, of those organizations in setting them up for retirement. And a lot of scary things going on with the pandemic health related, a lot of scary things going on financially related. So as the markets fluctuated greatly, and when I say fluctuated, basically at the beginning, all going down, we had a lot of scared people wondering what, what they should want and do. And so it became very important for us to figure out the best way of communicating. If we can't be there in person, obviously we made the shift to a much more virtual approach, but, you know, we needed to meet consistent with our communications, you know, I think Megan mentioned in hers as far as upping those those outreaches, if you will, to to be there to be available for the help those people that are scared of what's going on, what what should they do? Um, from an organizational level, there's a lot of things going on legislatively that was affecting how plans were being operated. We wanted to make sure that we were communicating those changes going forward as being a real resource with you know, being able to answer the questions as far as how is this going to impact the retirement plan. So there's that piece of it. There's the other side of it is talking about, you know, our sponsorships and that type of thing. You know, you're not going to see Mutual America commercial at the Super Bowl. What you are going to do is see us support the clients that we we deal with, and that's really the nonprofit community. And so events like Aaron's, the Avant Garden, and things similar to that are really our best marketing and really our best networking opportunities that that's how we grow our business and find out different opportunities. When we didn't have those to go to, we had to sort of shift gears. And I know a lot of organizations went some, some virtual fundraising activities and those worked some better than others, I would say. But, um, you know, we had to be nimble. And I think the really the key thing is asking our clients, what do they need from us? What we can't do this sponsorship and you can, your gala is not going to happen this year. What can we do to help out? And, and one of the things I would say, you know, previous to, 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 to the pandemic, Mutual of America had a employee matching program, which basically meant that any employee Mutual of America that gave to a charitable donation, Mutual of America would, would match that one-to-one, -one, give a dollar, Mutual of America a dollar. Through this, knowing that some of the sponsorships that we had probably planned on occurring in the future weren't going to happen, what we did is we doubled that up. So any charitable donation given by a uh, Mutual of America employee, now instead of it matching it dollar for dollar, we matched it two to one. So I thought that was a great testament from Mutual of America standpoint. And, and I, I really think from an employee standpoint, made me feel good. Hey, I want to go help these certain organizations. Now I'm got you know I'm going to triple basically the donation that would have otherwise given. So you know it's just trying to be nimble, trying to figure out, you know, other things we did as far as trying to disperse PPE to our clients. Um, we work with a lot of nonprofit clinics that were frontline employees. We, we provided food where they're, you know, trying to lessen a little bit of what they had to go through on, you know, imagine what it, how hard it had to actually be or still is. Um, but just trying to do creative things, you know, more on the events, 
you know, a couple other things that we were able to do that I thought were maybe a little more fun were uh, we'd have like craft cocktails or wine tasting in your living room. So we would package up, we went, we'd have somebody do it, mail out the ingredients and how to make a Manhattan. And then they sign into a WebEx and we'd have a bartender there walking them through the different steps to making a Manhattan, you know, just trying to liven things up, make it a little more fun. Same thing. You, you send them a bunch of little bottles of wine and you go through, like if you were at a vineyard and have somebody explain to you the differences of that type of thing. So just, you know, trying to be creative in, 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 and again, I think the most important thing is asking and listening to what our clients need. That's great. Doug, anything you want to add? Um, I'll just add something really short because you know, basically my role is I, I'm meeting with people one-on-one -on -one to do their planning, you know, so it's, it's typically a person close to retirement or in retirement. And, you know, so obviously all that was virtual and people got used to that, the one-on-ones and some actually might've preferred it. But um, what, what I found this year, which was really interesting was, you know, because a lot of people build giving into their plan and we always encourage people to have, you know, when we talk about what, what they need for money in retirement to try and, you know, if it's important to them for their giving to have that plan in their plan. And what we found, well, what I found anyway, with meeting with, especially with people who are retired that, you know, when we were, we were updating their plan and seeing how things were going during COVID is their expenses actually were way down. Um, so I'll share with you in a little bit, but their actual giving in some cases went up because their expenses were down. They weren't doing their trips and they figured, what should we do? Should we build it up for next year? Or we could, you know, give it. And with some of the stuff that were going on, a lot were, a lot were doing that. And the other thing I've found meeting with so many people is a lot of people going through the early parts of COVID. It, it's weird to talk about, but they all of a sudden really started getting interested in estate planning. Mm -hmm. um, what if something happened to me? What, you know, so there was a lot of, questions about you know that and about plan giving afterwards it just got to be a really popular topic um last year people just started to just think about you know what what would happen if something happened to me i want to make sure things go in the right direction so and then the other one was um required minimum distributions was a hot topic last year too just because they didn't have to do it last year but they were planning on what we're going to do with it this year which i'll kind of talk about in a couple seconds too yeah thanks doug adam i, I don't know um if you want to share a little bit too, I, I think that you all have your community partners award program, but I imagine that fits into your bigger mix of sort of philanthropic efforts. You know, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jody. Yeah, we have we have our foundation, Mutual America Foundation, which was established, I guess, uh, we had our 25th anniversary last year. So um, it is, is any foundation, we give out grants throughout the year. But one of the unique things we also, that the foundation does is it has this community partnership award where it's not a grant, it's a, it's a competition. So what we have is a charitable organization submit their um, submission, I guess, uh, to try to win this award. And each year uh, we we give out uh, five different award winners. There's the national award winners and honorees. But with that, there's, there's a sort of a cash <laughs> award, but also a lot of uh, acknowledgement in, in press, pu public, publicizing the award and the program that they submitted for, for to win that. In fact, uh, just last week, I was fortunate enough to have a, a group here in Kansas City win one of our honoree um, awards. So we were able to go out and, and, and notify them at, at their location that they would be receiving a $50,000 uh, cash award, but they'd also have a bunch of different acknowledgements going forward. Um, the national winner receives 100,000. Um, we also do a, uh, a doc, put together a documentary for them, um, as well as a bunch of other um, sort of public, public, publicizing, you know, the great uh, program they put together. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's, a, it's pretty impressive when all the things that go along with it besides just the cash award too, so. That's great. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, kind of, you know, uh, shift our, our gears a little bit to talk about the future, just paying attention to our time today for, for the chat. Um, you know, we, you know, in planning talked a little bit about just not just reflecting on what changed in the past year, but looking ahead um, and, you know, the opportunities going forward and changes from the past year that, that will stick. So I, I wanna kind of shift our focus there um, to start us off, though, Doug, I wondered if you could give us a sense, you know, for some trends that you're seeing. You already mentioned a couple of things that you started to see um, for with clients that you're working with, but uh, anything that might be helpful as people begin to think about the future? 
Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I have just to share a little bit too with my background too. Before I was with Mutual, I was a finance director for a nonprofit for about 12 years and a broker for about another eight years after that. This is my 19th year now with Mutual. So, you know, back when I was a finance director, just like, you know, Megan and Sean and Aaron, you know, it was, you know, we're trying to find diversity in, you know, because at different times when the markets and the economy are reacting, there's different segments that do, you know, better, whether it's individual, whether it's, foundations, whether it's corporate, we did thrift stores. So we always want to have diversity. So just to give, you know, there are kind of some fun things, but, um, you know, when we look at 2020 as a whole of giving, um, as all of those categories put together, it was up 3.8% in 2020 versus 2019, which was to me kind of shocking. But, you know, what it kind of came from the, you know, the first part of the year was obviously very, very rough, but then the markets kind of, then everything kind of came back. And I try and tie it together with kind of three categories versus the market. When I say market, we talk about the market, we talk about the economy, and we usually talk about employment, those kind of factors. And then we kind of break down the overall giving by individual giving, by foundations and by corporations, because they're very separate and then they react differently. So if we look at 2020, individual giving strictly was up just, just under a percent. So it was 0.9%. Um, and when you think about all the uncertainty that was going on in 2020, um, I think a lot of people didn't give with unemployment and everything, but then I think we saw a whole new generation giving money with everything that was going on. I know here locally um, with George Floyd, I mean, my kids were, you know, they're in college and they were actually giving money to, you know, different things. I mean, I think it was a whole other generation giving to like human services. So um, that was pretty flat. Corporate giving was down 7.3%. This is all according to the Giving USA Foundation, um, which I think is pretty recognized. So, and that was basically because of COVID, companies were really uncertain what was going on. So that dropped a lot, but foundation giving, you know, oddly enough was up over 15%. And that was basically because the second half of the year, the markets just came back with gangbusters and the corporations actually had a very good year. So you saw the giving going there. Um, when we're looking ahead to 2021, um, what, you know, what they're saying in the, in that industry is saying that the um, individual giving is probably going to be up about 6% with a large part of that coming from people doing a little more plan giving and also require minimum distributions. Because again, you know, last year they canceled it. So a lot of, you know, again, the older generation, you know, have this money that they have to take out. They didn't have to take anything out in 2020 and their qualified money grew tremendously if they were even 23% in the market. So I think, you know, the IRS and U.S. kind of thought the markets were going to come, you know, so far down and stay down, but the markets came back. So it was, you know, I'm not from the IRS, but it's almost like they didn't have to do the non-RMD, but they did. So this year, there's going to be more sizable withdrawals. So, and there's obviously much advantages in giving directly from it. Um, corporate giving is expected. Again, these are expected numbers to be up about just over 4%. And that's because, you know, our GDP is right now, it's growing. You know, we had a recession there in the first few, few quarters of 2021. Now we're kind of back on the upswing, but you know, the future is kind of uncertain with, you know, COVID and different, you know, strains. So they're, they're, you know, they're saying up a little bit. And that's why I think the foundation right now is what they're estimating in the last quarter was saying that it's going to be a pretty flat because we just don't know the markets have done decently. But as you look forward, there's just a lot of market uncertainty and a lot of uh, uncertainty in, in the market. So their foundations are kind of up in the air right now. But again, that's why, you know, when I know, you know back when I was, you know, doing it was, you know, we just kind of, you know, when we talk about the markets, we talk about the economy, unemployment, and again, different giving things that you give differently during all those, you know, things happen. And the you know, last thing I want to say is kind of what's, what's important when I've seen a big trend. And again, is, you know, what, what I do and what we like to do is a lot of individual planning. And, you know, with your participants that you work with, you know, encourage the, to have that planning in their financial plans. So when they're thinking about, geez, I'm retiring, you know, what are things are important to me to build that giving? And when we see people do that with their plans, they actually then give annually versus saying, hey, if I have extra money, I'll do it. But for building it into it, then then obviously estate planning is to me uh, getting really popular, not popular, but people are really starting to think about estate planning a lot more um, now more than ever. No. Well, thanks for the overview, Deb. That's yeah. great. Um, you know, I, I want to hear it now from uh, Aaron and Megan and Sean. Um, I'm curious about your observation about giving trends too, and especially as you think about what's happening next, you know, what you've been seeing and how that's shifting, you know, from your perspective, has individual giving sustained, changed, grown or not grown? 
Um, oh, Sean, do you want to go? Or I can't. Um, I, from my perspective, I, I think it has has sustained. I mean, I think there was there was that period that Sean kind of mentioned at the beginning of the end of our our fiscal year. You know, FY nineteen, that was like, oh my gosh, we don't have any earned income, and like donors were feeling the like just the anxiety of what is going to happen here. And so we did get a few people that were sort of like, I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can f- fulfill my pledge this year. Um, but largely that has gone away. And I mean, we have not lost a ton of people. I mean, in my little area, we haven't lost anybody. Um, and I, I think that I can speak more broadly and say that it that hasn't really, what we were worried about hasn't really panned out. So, and I think that's just related to the market, you know, um, so I think moving forward, we, we are all um, very hopeful that that will continue. And, and, you know, I think wanting to put a lot of energy into um, individuals, bringing people back, you know, kind of re upping that cultivation um, with, I mean, hopefully, hopefully with kind of a more return to normal, even though of course none of us know if that's possible, but, um, you know, just, just with the hope that, um, people can try to like re-engage, um, in some way. So, yeah. So can I, let me piggyback on that. Um, you know, I've been at the Walker a long time and I think what we're seeing now is somewhat akin to what we saw in 2008, 2009, um, where it really was our individual donors that sustained us, that sustained the walker. Uh, they were much less likely, and well, as Megan said, there, there were definitely, you know, some larger pledges where, you know, donors were just like, I just don't know if I can do that this year when, when we were in the midst of that precipitous drop in the stock market, but certainly with the rebound that we've seen and, uh, you know, while we're, we're, you know, everyone talks about that, the, the K recovery, um, you know, the individuals are very, very passionate about their support for the walker. And it, it just seems to me like we're seeing is, is very similar to what we experienced sort of during the last recession, which was, you know, it's, you know, as Adam kind of mentioned, you know, corporate giving is down and, you um, some, and Sean can speak to more about this from like corporate annual fund, but um, I think that's been impacted more than individual giving. Sean, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I guess like on that last point and, you know, something I know we had kind of talked about a little earlier, Charity, is just, you know, shifts in priorities um, for corporate foundations and foundations in general. Um, one in response to the pandemic, but also kind of in a broader response to social shifts and, uh, and social justice initiatives, um, you know, like that has impacted us. Um, you know, so we've had some big foundations and some, you know, bigger corporate partners step away. Um, you know, I, I, you know, try to follow up and say, hey, but, you know, the arts are important <laughs> to these do these things as well, um, you know, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of tracking that and seeing like, hey, here's a trend we've seen over time. Here's a trend we're seeing in this moment. Will certain organizations just have uh, COVID questions or social justice, you know, BIPOC related questions as a main focus of their giving, as a portion of their giving, or is it something that they're they want to know that we're invested in as an organization, but it won't impact their giving. Um, so it's kind of being able to be nimble and tracking all those things and being able to respond like, oh, okay, you know, we can mention a few of these uh, initiatives that we're doing, and we can also follow up with a, a longer document that goes into more detail about our DEIA strategies and the relationship to the strategic plan. So it's kind of trying to be able to nimble, be nimble to, you know, who knows what's it's a little more uneven on the corporate side. So you're like, eh, you know, maybe let's try this. Um, so yeah, it's just, I would say we're just trying to be as flexible and nimble and as ready to be like, you know, cause as I think most people know, you know, there's been a ton of government like with the ARP American rescue plan and all this money coming through that, you know, certain deadlines are super, super quick these last few months. And so we're trying to just turn that stuff out and being like, yeah, yeah, let's go for it. We have to go for it. 
uh, and let's juggle these timelines as best as we can. That's great. Well, so I, I guess a, a follow-up question for you all is more about then what's going to stick from this past year that sort of the changes in your strategies that you think we're going to, are going to help you. And then also, you know, thinking about these shifts that are still sort of ongoing, um, how are you prioritizing and, uh, what you do, the efforts that you make and um, assessing bandwidth and all of that. And I'd love to hear from each of you. Sean, Megan, and Aaron. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, I mentioned before, you know, feeling like um, the one-on-one -on -one personal communication is going to be important moving forward. And I think that's that's definitely, true and it will be a focus. I mean, it's something in, you know, in my role, I do a lot of different things. I'm writing grants. I'm, you know, dealing with individuals. Um, I, I won't even go into all the things, but it's, you know, so it's a lot, a lot of times those emails can take a back seat and be like, oh, I didn't get that done today. And like, uh, but the thing passed and eh, whatever, I'll just, I'll get them next time. And like, I've, I've started to be a little bit more strict with myself. Like, no, you need to like, this is actually the most important thing you're doing today, even though it seems like it's maybe not because it's not, you know, relate it, you know, it's, it's not directly tied to dollars. Right. But it's like the relationship um, building. So yeah, that's what I would say. That's great advice. Yeah, that's great. Great. Yeah, and, and I mean, I would I would echo that. Um, you know, I put, you know, again, I've been doing this for a little while, and you know, what I've always tried to prioritize is the stewardship piece, which is, you know, just staying in touch with our partners. You know, I, I may we may create a sponsorship around a program, say it's an exhibition that's on view for three months. Well, you know, I always approach those things as, you know, year long partnerships. Um, the benefits that a sponsor might get, you know, certainly are focused around the specific program that occurs for three months. Um, but, you know, during those other, you know, nine months, I'm, we're trying to engage them to, to come. I, and, and quite frankly, when I'm just doing a lot of emailing, for me, that's sort of the lazy way. For me, it's a little, what I try to do more, what I did more of in the pandemic and what I hope to do more of in the future is, you know, getting on the phone with folks and now, you know, to the extent possible, you know, just having face-to-face -face meetings because I, I don't think there's any uh, replacement for that. You know, and again, people get so many, you know, our inboxes are just cluttered and full you know, and so kind of going old school and, uh, you know, phone calls and meetings when possible uh, is really, I think, you know, it, it, the results speak for themselves, I think. Great. Sean, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I mean, totally agree with both Megan and Aaron. I would say just bandwidth and strategy wise, um, we have a lot of documents tracking like who owns what relationship and you know when deadlines are and we really just try to sync those flows so sometimes i'm really busy megan will pick up something for me vice versa so we you know we really try to map out when we're having these like points of congestion and we really, so we so you know we're not getting inundated and slammed and then you know we also you know we create a document every year where we look at the last year in a lot of different detail, like where the expenses were, where the money was, how many partners we had, and we just dissect the work we do. And, you know, we map it out. I mean, my document looks over 10 year span and I can track and, you know, write those conversations. So we can say, oh, we had a dip here. Oh, it's similar as Aaron was saying to 2008 or, oh, we saw this come in, you know, where, what's our average, what's our norm. And that kind of helps look ahead where, you know, I know last year COVID, you know, hit my numbers. I had less partners, less this, where, you know, going forward, I expect to see an increase. Um, and so, yeah, we just do a lot of try to on the back end so we can prepare as much going forward and have a strategy and a plan. So we know, you know, how we're going to approach partners and how we're as a department thinking about our overall development strategy. Great. Very interesting. Um, well, I know we're at time here, so I just want to ask a final sort of wrap-up question before we go. Um, 
you know, I, I've been asking this at every uh, lunchtime chat just about resources. You know, what resources or partners have you really relied on in the past year that you'll continue to, to rely on going forward? Um, just as examples for people, as they think about, you know, resources they might seek out or partners that they might consider working with as they look at their fundraising strategies going forward. And feel free to just name one, or if you've got two on the top of your mind right now. Are you talking about partners outside of the organization yeah. or internally? Uh, I guess it could be either, you know, if you've got, a, a, for example, a board member that you really relied on, you know, and that relationship was key. Well, you know, Sean mentioned this at the top of the, at the top of the order, but as a multidisciplinary arts center, you know, the Walker has these great resources in our, you know, our visual arts curators, our Pelly team, our designers. And um, I know for my own purposes, I, I really rely on collaborating with those groups to help deliver for my, my sponsors. Okay, great. So keeping those relationships that were important too. Uh, something that I find myself kind of using a lot, uh, we have the Minnesota Council of Foundations um, and these like nonprofit councils. Um, that you know have listings of webinars, have listings of upcoming deadlines, have listings of resources, and I just found myself being really thankful for that. So then we could kind of say, oh, I could hear from industry leaders across the board, or I could hear from various nonprofit heads, just to hear how they're approaching the upcoming year, or how they're thinking about the pandemic and how it's affected them. Um, and I, I've seen an increase in, you know, the number of organizations that are participating in that. Um, and I, I have found that to be really invaluable and one in our strategy, but also just kind of, you know, continuing that professional development work and how are we besting ourselves as an organization or do we have our finger on the pulse um, and just kind of relying on these organizations that, you know, collate all, <laughs> all this great information. That's great. Networks are important as, as speaking as the director of one. <laughs> uh, Megan. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I don't, I don't have any, I don't have any links to share, but I have, um, I have two, I have two close friends who work in development in other, in other areas of nonprofit fundraising, not in museums. And I think making time to see them in the last year. And I mean, just kind of, you know, wine, <laughs> or support each other has been really great. And I, you know, we, I know that everybody understands that like feeling of isolation and kind of working in isolation. And when you're, when your job is to build relationships, you kind of need to have, you need to fill your own well, right. To be able to connect with other people in an authentic way. So I think, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I do for me. <laughs> great. I like the fill your own well. Uh, good advice, Aaron. Where you want to add? Well, it? yeah, Cherry. Do we, if just for one one last thing? Um, in 2016, the Walker co-founded um, an organ, you know, a group called the Twin Cities Large Cultural Organizations Forum, um, Ticklecough for short. And it was originally, you know, put together to foster ethnic, cultural, and racial diversity and inclusion within those organizations, but. The development, our development department meets regularly with development colleagues from these other organizations to kind of talk about best practices and, you know, what's going on. We've been in touch. Um, Sean is really our representative who goes to most of those meetings. They, of course, they've been virtual um, recently, but I, I would imagine hopefully we'll, we'll start to be meeting in person again. But again, staying in touch with our colleagues um, kind of along lines of what Megan just mentioned, you know, so we can kind of stay up on who's doing what and what's going on is, has been really important. Great. Adam and Doug, anything you want to add to the list of resources or, you know, groups to be thinking about? I'm good, unless you got something, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, kind of what you guys have said too, as far as, you know, is, is, a, is a company that, works with nonprofits, we're very aware of the different associations. And I think it's more important than us than ever for us to pay attention to what's going on as far as listening to what you guys are going through and trying to figure out the best way to help. So I would just add that. Great. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone today. Thanks to our, our panelists, our 
for this great conversation uh, about an important topic. I know it's one on all of our minds. Um, and then to everybody who participated today, thanks for being here um, and watch for recording soon. Uh, we'll also be following up with a toolkit with um, some takeaways and resources that were shared in the last this session and the last two as a part of this series. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to stay on just for a little bit longer for a quick snap at the end here. But uh, otherwise, I would say uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you later. <laughs>